When was the last time you saw something amazing? When did you last say, I've never seen anything like this? Last week, Julie and I took a very short overnight trip to Rome for her birthday. We had booked it several weeks ago, and with everything that had happened, we thought about cancelling it. But our families encouraged us to go. And obviously, it ended up being a very different trip than we had planned, but it actually turned out to be really helpful for us both as we continue through our process of grief. As we walked down the ancient streets, it gave us time to think and reflect, and we had opportunities to talk with each other. And Rome is a beautiful city. It is filled with so much art, history, culture, and architecture. Every time you turn a corner, you see some ancient ruins or a magnificent painting. And even to our modern eyes, the sight of the spectacular buildings is utterly amazing. And I've been thinking about how 2,000 years ago, in the height of the Roman Empire, visitors and citizens must have been constantly going around saying, I've never seen anything like this. Over the last few Sundays, we've been looking together at the first half of Mark's Gospel. And there is a strong tradition that associates Mark with the city of Rome. It's likely that he wrote his biography about Jesus while in Rome for the newly converted Christians of that city. And in the story that Mark tells today, it is if he says to the, for his first readers that as amazing as the aqueducts, the palaces, the temples of their city are, they are nothing compared to the glorious deeds, words, and person of Jesus of Nazareth. At the end of the passage that we are looking at this morning, the people marvel at Jesus, saying, we have never seen anything like this. And today, I, I want to say to you that we can encounter that same sense of awe and wonder this morning, too. We might not be able to physically see and hear Jesus like the crowds do in this story, but through the presence of his Holy Spirit, we can know the reality of Jesus. And when we experience his hope, his goodness, his power, his forgiveness, it will leave us saying, I have never known anything like this. So if you have a Bible to hand, it would be great to have it open to Mark chapter 2. Uh, again, that's page 34 in the New Testament if you're using the Pew Bibles. And we're going to be looking just at verses 1 to 12 in more detail this morning. Now, I know this might be a familiar story to many of us, but I want us to imagine that we're hearing it for the very first time. So if you do know the story, just kind of forget that you know it for a moment because there are three big surprises in this story. There is the surprise of what Jesus sees, the surprise of what Jesus says, and then the surprise of who Jesus is. What Jesus sees, what Jesus says, and who Jesus is. So let's look at the first surprise in verses 1 to 4. And as we look at these verses this morning, I want you to use your imagination. And I want you to try and visualize what it would have been like to have been there in Peter's house that day. So imagine with me for a moment. You're one of the lucky ones that was able to get into the house and you have a front row view. It's packed in there, standing room only. The doorway is blocked and there are heads looking in through the windows from the outside. There's children up on their father's shoulders. As many people as possible are trying to get in to see Jesus. Everyone in the town was disappointed when they heard that Jesus had left to do a preaching tour of the region, but now he's back. What miracles is he going to do this time? So you were there in this crowded room, which must have felt like being on the dart on a big match day, and Jesus is sitting on a chair in the corner and he's speaking the word, telling stories about everyday life and teaching about the kingdom of God. You've never heard anything like it. The overcrowded room is hanging on his every word. But then you hear a bit of commotion coming from the door. 
several voices trying to get in, but no one is giving up their spot. The voices go away, and then you start to hear feet stomping on the roof above you. Now, of course, you're not in a building like this. You're in a typical first century Palestinian house, which would have been a single story building with a flat roof and a small stairs going up to it so it could be used as an outside space. And so you hear this noise and you look up and you start to see little bits of the ceiling falling down to the ground. And then bigger bits of the ceiling falling down to the ground. And then all at once, a large section of the roof is suddenly removed from above. Sunlight fills the room like a spotlight. And then a mat with a paralyzed man lying on it is lowered down in front of Jesus. Imagine what that would have been like. And his four friends then looking down through Peter's new skylight at what's happening on below. Have you ever seen anything like that? But what is Jesus going to say? There's this amazing sight, but what is Jesus going to say? Is he going to rebuke the four men for putting a hole in Peter's roof? Is he going to reject the paralyzed man? Will he get James and John to come and take him to the back like bodyguards removing someone from the stage of a concert? Or you might think, well, no, that neither of those options sound like Jesus. It's more likely he'll say something like, son, your faith has healed you, go in peace. That sounds a bit more kind of Jesus-y. But that's not what he says either. Look at what he does say in verse 5. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. That's not what anyone was expecting. His friends did not carry him all that, there that way and dug a hole in the roof so that his sins could be forgiven. That's not what was on their mind. His problem is that he can't walk. Doesn't Jesus see that? But Jesus knows this man's problem more clearly than anyone, even the man himself. This man's greatest need is not the ability to walk. His greatest need is for his sins to be forgiven. It's my greatest need too, and it's yours. Sin is humanity's biggest problem. Now, I know that if I was to stop 100 people outside on the street and ask them to list their problems, sin is probably not going to be mentioned very much, if even at all. But that's what makes sin such a big problem. We go through life unaware of its devastating consequences. Sin is deceitful. So we spend our lives chasing after fixes for lesser problems rather than dealing with our deepest need. Sin keeps us from God. Sin corrupts our minds and distorts our desires. Sin corrodes away at our relationships. Sin leads to death, and sin brings judgment. And that doesn't mean that our other problems in life aren't important, because of course they are. And as we will see, Jesus cares about the fact that this man lying on a mat in front of him can't walk. But Jesus is more concerned with his eternal life in heaven than he is with his legs on earth. It's like being seasick on a ship that is sinking. Yes, the sea sickness is a problem, but the greater problem is that the ship is sinking and you will drown unless you get into the lifeboat. So first, Jesus says to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And everyone is surprised. No one was expecting to hear that. But there were some there that day who weren't just surprised with Jesus's words, they were shocked. Look at verses six and seven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The scribes were the religious experts at the time and they would have been key leaders in the local synagogue. And when they hear Jesus' words, they're offended and outraged because they know that only God can forgive sins. And they're right. Only God can forgive sins. A third party can't forgive a wrong done to someone else. 
only the person who has wrong, been wronged can forgive. So say, for example, someone crashes into your car on your way home while you're stopped at a traffic light. And as you get out to look at the damage, a pedestrian comes over to the other driver and says, that's okay, I forgive you, off you go. I'm sure you'd want to shout out, no, that's not okay, because it's your car that's been damaged. It's your decision alone if you want to forgive them or not. Sin is breaking God's law, and only God can offer forgiveness. So when the scribes hear Jesus say that he is able to forgive sins, they think that he is claiming to be God, which is exactly what he is doing. The real surprise here in this story is not the man coming down from the roof, but it's who, what Jesus claims about who he is, that he is the God who descended from heaven in human form. Here in these verses, Jesus is claiming to be the Son of God. In verse 8, it says that Jesus then perceived in his spirit what they were discussing amongst themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Jesus knows what they are thinking. And if he was not trying to show his divinity with his words, then he would have made sure to clear it up. He would have said something like, oh, no, 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 I know what you're thinking, but no, that, that's not what I mean at all. But now instead, his next words show us that, yes, that's exactly what he's claiming. And he wants them to know that's what he's saying about himself. And then his actions that follow show us the proof that his claim is indeed true. So Jesus asks the scribes in verse 9, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk. One of my favorite things about Jesus is the questions that he asks. And this is a brilliant question. And its use here is genius. And I wonder how you would answer. Which do you think is easier to say? Your, to say your sins are forgiven to someone or to say stand up and take your mat to walk to someone who hasn't been able to walk? If it's just saying the words, then saying your sins are forgiven is probably the easier one, right? Because no one would really know if it actually happened or not. But if you say to a paralyzed man, get up and walk, then he's got to get up and walk. But of course, forgiveness isn't easy. For Jesus to offer us forgiveness of our sins, he would have to suffer many things. He would be rejected, he would be betrayed, he would be mocked, spat on, flogged, and killed. But Jesus doesn't give the scribes any time to answer, and he continues in verses 10 to 11. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, and then he turns back to looking at the paralyzed man and says to him, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. Now it's crunch time. I imagine the whole house is holding its breath, waiting to see what happens next. Because on the line is Jesus' claim to have the authority to forgive sins. If this man doesn't get up and walk, then Jesus is just a man and is guilty of blaspheming for claiming to be divine when he's not. But if the man does get up, then it will be a sign of Jesus' authority and proof of his claim to be the Son of God. And it is one of those two options, by the way. Either Jesus is who he claimed to be or he's not. There is no in-between option. And so we all need to make up our own mind about his claims in this passage and decide either to dismiss him as a blasphemer or to believe in him as the Son of God. How are we going to respond to what Jesus says today? Well, for the paralyzed man at least, he responded to Jesus' words with obedience. As Jesus spoke to him, a miracle happened in his body. Nerves were repaired and muscles received new life and he stood up and immediately took the mat and went home. And everyone who was squeezed into the house that day, who saw and heard all that happened, were all amazed and glorified God saying, 
we have never seen anything like this. C.S. Lewis is a famous, was a famous Christian author, best known for writing the Chronicles of Narnia. And he said that when it comes to the claims of Jesus, we only have three options. Either he was a liar, a lunatic, or he is the Lord. If he does not have the divine authority to forgive sins, then what he said makes him out either to be a liar, deliberately trying to deceive people, or he was insane, believing to be something that he clearly wasn't. And so Lewis writes, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall fat, flat at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with some patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Later on in Mark, we will see that the scribes come to the conclusion that he was a liar and set out to kill him. But the disciples will go on to put their faith in him as the Christ and the Son of God. For me, I'm convinced. I'm convinced that Jesus is who he claimed to be. I know that I was once like that man lowered to his feet, paralyzed by my sin. But Jesus, the Son of God, forgave my sins. And now I walk with him in this life. And one day I will run to him on the golden streets of the heavenly city. Many unexpected things can happen to us in this life. And at times it can feel like the ceiling above our heads has been ripped away. But through it all, we can depend on Jesus. So put your trust in him as the son of God. Ask him to forgive your sins and receive the hope and the good news that when we meet him face to face in his heavenly kingdom, we will every day for all eternity be amazed by him and continually glorify God saying, we have never seen anything like this. As we close, I want to lead us in a prayer now. It's a very short, simple prayer. And as I say through each line, you might just like to echo it in your own heart as we respond to this today. But let's take a moment and let's pray to God. Father God, I thank you that your son, Jesus Christ, loves me and gave himself for me. In humility, I lower myself before him now and confess my sins to you. Lord, please forgive me. Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ and the Son of God. Help me to trust you and live for you now and always. Amen.